We now find ourselves in chapter 65, and chapter 65 is titled, The Temple Cleansed Again. And the last time that we experienced the cleansing of the temple was all the way back, almost, well, 39 chapters ago in chapter 16. Chapter 16 was titled, In His Temple, and there's this fascinating little play on words here where Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, says, Take these things out of here. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. But in the latter part of the Gospels, Jesus is going to say, your house, this is in Matthew chapter 23, we're not quite there yet, but your house is left to you desolate. Notice the contrast. Get these things out of here in the first cleansing of the temple. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. After he cleanses the temple the second time, that's in Matthew 21, In Matthew 23, he's going to say, your house is left to you desolate. At the beginning of his ministry, my father's house. At the end of his ministry, when all of the evidences of his messianic identity had been refused and denied and rejected, your house is left to you desolate. Okay, so in his temple, chapter 16, and then now in chapter 65, the temple cleansed again. And uh, this is based on Matthew chapter 21. It's actually based on a number of passages. Um, Matthew chapter 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19. I'll read the Matthew passage. So, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, and uh, beginning in verse 12. And it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who had bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, quoting Isaiah here, right? Quoting Isaiah 56, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, just exactly like happened back in uh, chapter 16 of Desire of Ages, the first cleansing of the temple. And he healed them, verse 15. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, "Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, They were indignant. They were angry. And uh, then he said, do you hear what they are saying? They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? I have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now, this also includes the parable of the two sons in Matthew chapter 21. And then also the parable of the vine dressers, which is also found in Matthew chapter 21. So so this chapter really is made up of three parts, okay? This is a long chapter, but it divides nicely into kind of three parts. You have the cleansing of the temple, then you have the parable of the two sons, and then you have the parable of the vine dressers. And that's, all of those are in Matthew chapter 21. And I tell you, friends, I know I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. You almost cannot understand Matthew chapter 21 if you don't know Daniel chapter 9. I, like, you can understand Matthew 21, but you can't understand the flow, the narrative flow and context of what's happening here and the script that Jesus is following. I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. Jesus is not just making this up as he goes. He's not just like, well, let's just see how this all works out. Jesus is following a script. The script that Jesus is following, the Old Testament script that he's following, is found in the book of Daniel. And with regards to the rejection of the Messiah and the destruction of the city, he's following Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 to 27. Jesus knows what he knows, not because of some special revelation by God to him in prayer. With regards to the destruction of the temple and the city, Jesus knows that because he was familiar with the Old Testament prophecies of Daniel. Okay, It's it's important, it's crucial to understand this. And so this sequence of... Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. That sequence, Jesus is following the script of, not because he invented it. There's nothing novel here. It's because he's familiar with the Old Testament passages of Daniel. Now, there are other passages in the Old Testament that allude to this, but nothing as expressly as is found in Daniel chapter 9. Okay, so let's get into this. Let's get into this. So um, she begins by making contrasts and similarities between the cleansing of the temple the first time around 
And then now the second cleansing of the temple. And I really like the point that I made there at the outset, which is take these things out of here. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. That's the opening cleansing. The closing cleansing, your father's, or excuse me, your house is left to you desolate. That's the very last verse of Matthew chapter 23. Okay, when Jesus leaves the temple for the last time, because Jesus is in the temple here, or he's in Jerusalem, and he's going to walk out of that temple in Matthew chapter 23. He's going to go sit up on the hill overlooking Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 24 and deliver what's called the Olivet Discourse, which we'll get to, but that's where he's going to say, not one stone here will be left upon another. So Jesus is in the temple. Remember, he took that private time, that quiet time to go and look at all the things. He knows it's over. If they don't repent, it's over. There's no hope. There's no recovery at this point. And again, the 70-week prophecy is not fulfilled yet. We're, just, we're down to the last few years. But if there's no change of direction, if there's no change of heart, if there's no change of orientation with regards to Torah and to Messiah, destruction will be the inevitable consequence. I'm not even sure the word punishment occurs in this chapter. Maybe it does. I don't remember the word punishment in the last chapter, and I don't remember it in this chapter, but let's get into this. So she makes um, these, these parallels, and they're very similar. She talks about how the, the temple was basically like a vast cattle yard, and she says it all had to do with money, greed, both last chapter and this chapter, the greed of gain. She uses the word avarice, which means greed, extreme greed. And there's a dangerous thing that happens when religion gets tied up with money. When we have the monetization of guilt and of shame, you know that you're dealing with a faulty religious system. It happened in the medieval period with the Catholic Church, and it happened in the New Testament and the Old Testament. There are numerous passages in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament where the temple service was leveraged and capitalized, which is exactly the right word, from capitalism. It was capitalized on for the purpose of generating income for the religious leaders and the aristocracy. By the way, we see that today, don't we? Don't we see a lot of these high-flying, big-shot religious leaders with their mega churches and high, big salaries and, and fancy cars and private jets and right? Like the monetization of religion is as old as, you know, they talk about how the oldest uh, uh, um, job, right? The oldest vocation is prostitution, right? Well, and a vocation that's at least that old is the leveraging of religion for money, which is actually a form of prostitution, right? It's a form of, and I'm not suggesting here that you can't make money as a minister. The Levites' needs were taken care of but you should not be able to go and you should not, I was almost going to say you should not be able to. I'll say that. You should not be able to become rich being a minister. You should be able to live an ordinary life, like a, knife, a life like maybe a nurse would live, right? Like that level of income or a teacher or something so that you can take care of your basic expenses and drive a car and own a house and pay for your children to go to school and eat well and that's it. These, this is a service, it's a, it's, the, it's a service job. Teaching is a service-oriented job. Nursing is a service-oriented job. And I know there are other service-oriented jobs that pay much better, like, say, being a doctor or something. But when you see these pastors that are high-rolling and these religious leaders that are high-rolling, I mean, I don't know, have you, ever, have you ever been to the Vatican? Anybody here been to the Vatican? The first time I ever went to the Vatican, I was like, get me out of here. I hated it. I hated it. And the reason that I hated it was not because the sculptures weren't beautiful and the paintings weren't aesthetically pleasing. I hated it because I knew that all of this money had been basically extorted from the people leveraging human guilt, human shame, human ignorance, human fear. I mean, basically, Catholicism is, medieval Catholicism is the giant monetization of human guilt. And no wonder they're the wealthiest institution in the world. The wealthiest institution in the world today, right? It's priceless. How do you put a price on the works of art and all, not to mention all of the incredible finances that are found in, you know, the, the modern Catholic church? 
How do they have so much money? Simple. They created a product even better than an iPhone, even better than a Tesla, even better than Bitcoin. They created the product of releasing, releasing, appearing to release human beings from guilt and shame and fear, right? They monetized it. They monetized it. And so when I was there, I was like, yeah, that's a beautiful sculpture. Yes, that's a beautiful tapestry. Yes, that's a beautiful painting. Yes, this is a beautiful building. It's aesthetically pleasing. And it was all disgusting to me. And the reason is because all of it was built on lies and guilt and shame and fear. And people, it's not just the medieval Catholic Church or even the modern Catholic Church that's done this. There's plenty of evangelical mega pastor that has leveraged religion for straight up monetization, just making money. And that's what she says here in this chapter. She says it was greed. So the priests, who in their quieter moments probably knew, yeah, this isn't ideal. This isn't, you know, probably best. You know, the, the sensitive hearted priests, if there were any, and there were some, they would have known this is a farce. It's a far cry from what God had intended but as soon as people have a profit-based, money-based interest in something, they will very often surrender their moral, ethical, scriptural principles because of money. It's, this is what Paul means when he says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay, so that's what she's describing here. She says they were controlled by their greed of gain, right? Right? And then she talks about, and I thought this was fascinating, how all of the blood that was spilt there, she says, all of this blood, the offering of blood, I'm in that next paragraph, the offering of blood had almost, they had almost lost sight of the fact that it was sin that made necessary all the shedding of the blood of beasts. They did not discern that this blood prefigured the blood of God's dear son, which was to be shed for the life of the world. And then this is so interesting especially for me as an animal lover and as a former animal rights activist, right? Like a big part of what led me into Christianity was my, and I talk about this, I actually just talked about it yesterday. I was a strict vegan, vegetarian, you know, really pro animal rights. And so I thought it was very fascinating in that next paragraph where she says, Jesus looked upon the innocent victims of sacrifice. She's talking about animals. Talk about animals there. Jesus looked upon the innocent victims of sacrifice and saw how the Jews had made these great convocations scenes of bloodshed and cruelty. Now, if you haven't yet read the book, The Problem of Pain, my oldest son just finished reading that book. I, I made a list of 50 books for him to read. I said, it's actually for both of my sons, but my youngest son is still in high school, so he doesn't really have the free time to do much of it yet. But I created a list of 50 books for my oldest son to read, I said, these are 50 books that'll change your life. Read these books over the next two or three years. And um, one of those books was The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, and he just finished it. And one of the chapters in that book is where Lewis talks about the problem of animal pain. Animal pain, the pain of animals. And we now live in a day and age where animals are just a commodity. They're, they're, they're nothing, right? They're just, all, they're just to be turned into leather or turned in to meat or turned into whatever thing that we want to extract from them. And very often, very often, it's done with the greatest indifference and cruelty. Cruelty. And it's, it's absolutely shameless. It's a complete perversion of God's intention for man's stewardship of the world. And it's fascinating to me that she notes that here. She calls them innocent victims. You might be saying, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. God established the system of animal sacrifice. Of course he did. And those animal sacrifices were supposed to be, right? In, in um, just the words that come to my mind are the words, the old words of, of former president Bill Clinton when he was talking about abortion, right? And even as a Democrat, he had the temerity to say what no Democrat would say today. And that is that abortion, no Democrat politician would say today. And that is that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Now, I think it should be not legal. I've already made that clear. And it should be not only rare, it should be, it should not happen. Okay, but here's the point. 
that phrase, safe, legal, and rare, comes to my mind. God's establishment of the sanctuary system was that the, the ending of the life of an animal was supposed to be so impactful that it caused you to startle to your senses and say, whoa, whoa, the wages of sin is death, and there should have been many fewer, many fewer sacrifices than just like lavishing all of this blood as if God's some kind of a bloodthirsty God. And then she quotes a number of passages uh, in which she basically says that God is not after bloody sacrifice, which is a little weird if you've read the book of Exodus or you've read the latter third of the, excuse me, the book of Leviticus or the latter third of the book of Exodus. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of bloodshed. A, a, a lot of blood shed there. But what's happening here is the blood that was shed served no no ethical, moral, or religious purpose. It was just like a get-out-of-jail-free card. And this is why Micah says in Micah chapter 6, and we've dealt with this already, you know, with what shall I come before the Lord? With thousands of rams? With rivers of oil? Would God be happy with rivers of blood? What if I sacrificed my own son? For God And God's like, are you kidding? Don't you know the story of Abraham and Isaac? Genesis 21. I don't require supreme sacrifice. I provide supreme sacrifice. And so I just love the fact that in this chapter, she makes the point that the sacrifice just became a round of ceremonies, cruelty, bloodshed, because there was money in it. There's money in it. I'm mean, just think of the way you love your pets. Think of the way you love your pets. I mean... The Bible says, and I don't want to get too far down this road, but I do want to make this point. The Bible says that even a little sparrow doesn't fall to the ground, but that God is aware of it. Now, just let that settle into your heart right now. If the infinite, eternal, omnipotent God of the universe is cognizant, and not just cognizant, but his heart is touched when a sparrow dies, that tells us a lot about the nature of God, the sensitive beautiful nature of God. This is what's meant in the Old Testament prophecy where it says when Jesus comes, he wouldn't, he wouldn't break a bruised weed or quench a smoking flax. It's saying that he was gentle. What's Ellen White's like favorite word in describing Jesus in this whole book? Tender. 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 And the wanton slaughter of animals for greed and profit is not tender. It's cruel, it's unnecessary, and it's disgusting. It's revolting to God. And it was not his plan. It was a perversion of his plan where animal sacrifices should have been few and far between. And of course, the punchline to the animal sacrifices is that Jesus is going to show up and show the futility of animal sacrifices because, as Paul will say later in the book of Hebrews, it's not even possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So thank the Lord Jesus we no longer you know, offer these kinds of animal sacrifices. But what was happening here was the monetization of human shame and human guilt and religion, and it's all revolting to God. And this is why he says, you've made my father's house like a den of thieves. And I see a lot of people getting the word tender. Correct. Exactly correct. Tender, tender, tender. If God knows that even a little sparrow falls to the ground and his heart is moved, well, then this... Wanton bloodshed of innocent victims for profit, devoid of the ethical moral principle that was attached to it, was disgusting and revolting to Yahweh. Okay, so she quotes several, and listen, she even says here, she says here, he knew that his blood, oh, this is fascinating. She says, he knew that his blood, his own blood, was soon to be shed for the sins of the world and would be as little appreciated by the priests and elders as was the blood of beasts, which they kept incessantly flowing. Whoo! And then she quotes several passages to that effect from 1 Samuel 15 and Isaiah 10. Um, and so she basically says that he knew that he had to give another evidence of his divinity. And this is where she says, as she has several times in this book, divinity flashed through humanity. She says that in that next paragraph or two paragraphs later, divinity flashed through humanity that happened on the Mount of Transfiguration 
It happened uh, in the first cleansing of the temple, several times where it was like, whoa, Jesus is God, right? Like, like it's almost like the garb of humanity couldn't contain the glory of divinity and it flashed through. And they were like, whoa. And because remember, she says in the next uh, page, she says that that first cleansing of the temple, when Jesus like just drove them all out, he was just a humble travel worn, you know, unorthodox rabbi that they were like, why did we run from that guy? We shouldn't have run. Why did we run? If that ever happened again, we would never run. Yeah. He caught us off guard. Yeah. We, we, we wouldn't run now. And then she says that not only did they run the second time, she says they ran faster and quicker and they were more terrified. Because divinity, his eyes, his eyes, the purity of his presence, the conviction of his demeanor, the, 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 the flash of divinity, not in Superman-like strength, but in Christ-like purity and holiness, they couldn't stand before it. Now, and then she paints this fascinating scene. I, I hope you got this because it's a cool scene. I'd love to see this done in like a movie, right? Or like some cinematography. Maybe they'll do it on the, on the Chosen. But this is so cool. She depicts this scene. This is the paragraph that begins, on the way from the temple. She says, as the priests are running away, she says they're driving their cows before them. Oh, this is so funny. So you know how when you get on an airplane, they say, um, like, look, in case of emergency, don't try to get your bags. Because I guess some people would be stupid enough, like, or, you know, I don't know, whatever. Foolish enough, like in the middle of, we're evacuating an airplane, right? And, oh, no, I just need to get my, I need to get my bag out of my overhead compartment, right? Like, no, leave all that stuff there. We're trying to not die here. And so the priests are, like, fleeing. But can't you just see the picture in your mind's eye of how they're running around trying to identify which cow is theirs? And so she says... Priests and traitors fled from his presence, driving their cattle before them. Like, come on, Bessie, come on, you know, like driving their cow before them. So she creates this scene where everybody's fleeing from Jesus like they said they wouldn't. But the word on the street is that Jesus is in town. And so all of the humble, all of the infirmed, all of the diseased, all of the outcasts are actually heading toward the temple and they pass one another in the street. It's a great scene, right? Like, here come the priests, the terrified priests and money changers, and they're driving their cows before them, and they got a dove under this arm and, and a lamb under this arm, and they're running with their overhead baggage in their arms, and here come all these other people, and they're like, what, what happened? Right? So this is, friends, this is a little miniature of the second coming. How cool is this? The same Jesus, watch this, the same Jesus that's attracting sinners and attracting children. She makes a great point to say that especially the children, the children rushed to Jesus, attracting the ill, the sinners, the outcasts, the children. That same Jesus is driving away the pretentious, greedy, religious leaders and priests. Same Jesus. Same Jesus. This is what's going to happen at the end when it says, when, when the wicked say to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Not the wrath of the leopard, the wrath of the lion, the wrath of the tiger. No, 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 no. The wrath of the lamb. So there's going to be a whole group of people. And by the way, she says it's not a small group. It's a little miniature of the second coming here. She says a large number pressed through the hurrying crowd. So they're kind of passing one another. These people are fleeing for their life and these people are being drawn to Messiah. And can't you see that scene in your mind's eye? It's, it's, it's magic. It's just incredible. Uh, these people are fleeing. Ah, get us away, get us away. And then these other people are like, oh, is, is Jesus here? We've heard Jesus is in the temple teaching. A large number pressed through the hurrying crowd, eager to reach him who was their only hope. When the multitude fled from the temple, many stayed behind. I love that. A large number and many. We sometimes get this idea that there's only going to be a precious few that just sneak in. Friends, this isn't a study on the book of Revelation, but I'm only going to say that that number, 144,000, is not a literal 144,000 people. I know there's lots of people that believe that. That's not what's being taught there. What's being taught there is the largest number that you will find in your Bible is not million. Try to find the word million in your Bible or billion or trillion or quadrillion. It's not there. 
the, the largest demarcation was thousand, thousand. And if you really wanted to say a gigantic number, you could say 10,000, right? And then you could say like a thousand times a thousand or 10,000 times 10,000. This was just a way of saying a gigantic innumerable number of people. Don't forget that in the book of Revelation, John says there was a number so large no one could number them. 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 1,000. This is inclusive, Old and New Testament, 12 patriarchs, 12 apostles, 12 times 12 is 144, times 1,000, 144,000. That's saying an inclusive multitude, Jew and Gentile, Old and New Testament, it's a giant innumerable number. That's what's being said. That's what's being said there. It's a hugely symbolic number, okay? And uh, I, I, by the way, I wouldn't, deny that it's possible God could, you know, theoretically have some significance to the actual literal number 144,000. I'm not against that, but that's not the main thing that's being communicated there because John expressly says it was a number that no man could number, an innumerable multitude. And so I love it when it says there's all these people fleeing, but not everybody fled, a large, what does she say, number, and many remain behind. Friend, there's going to be a lot of people saved. It's going to be a lot of people that f flee not from Jesus, but to Jesus. Everybody's going to flee. Everybody at the end of time is going to flee. We're either going to flee from or flee to. And this is the great lesson of the Garden of Eden. I'm preaching now, right? The great lesson of the Garden of Eden is that, that God is not someone to flee from. He's someone to flee to. God is not someone to hide from. He's someone to hide in. We've talked about that, Right? Your life is hidden with Christ in God, Colossians chapter 3. He's not someone to flee from. He's someone to flee to. He's not someone to hide from. He's someone to hide in. Hide in Christ. Flee to Christ. Woo! Come on now. So you got this scene. So cool. And uh, I just wrote here, glory. This is the paragraph that begins after a season. So after, after a little while, when, when, you know, the, you know, it had all died down and, and the, Priests had fled and they realized Jesus wasn't trailing them, chasing them down. Um, he's still back in the temple teaching. She says they quietly snuck back and she paints this scene. And I just wrote the word glory. I just wrote the word glory. Listen to this. After a season, the priests and rulers ventured back to the temple. When the panic had abated, they were seized with anxiety to know what would be the next movements of Jesus. They wanted to go back and see. Like a, the, the criminal returns to the scene of the crime, Right? Uh, just jumping out a couple uh, sentences here. Quietly returning to the temple, they had heard the voices of men and women and children. Ah, praising God. Upon entering, they stood transfixed before the wonderful scene. They saw the sick healed, the blind restored to sight, the deaf received their hearing, the crippled leap for joy. The children were foremost in the rejoicing. Jesus had healed their maladies. He had clasped them in his arms. They re he had received their kisses of grateful affection. Oh, come on now. God wants your kisses of affection. You come on. And the kids, in fact, listen to this. Some had even fallen asleep on his breast as he was teaching the people. Jesus is the center of attention, man. Oh, you need a place to nap? How about you nap right here? Oh, you want to give me a kiss? Give me a kiss. You want to play on my lap? Come play on my lap. You want to lay at my feet? Uh, just come here. I want people in my presence. And you show, we've already seen with Mary. He's very happy for people to show demonstrations of affection and worship that other people were like, ooh, that's a, that's a bit much. That's a bit affectionate. And look, not everybody is as affectionate as others. I get it. But for those that are really affectionate and really touchy, Jesus is like, sure, come on over. Give me a big hug. Give me a kiss. Lay on my breast, right? Put your head here. L come to my feet. He loves acts of worship. He loves acts of worship. Friends, I love that. How cool is that? And um, then she says, this is so cool. That scene, that scene that I wrote, Glory, she says on the next page, let's see, 698, listen to this. She says this, this is several paragraphs later, so I won't make you find it, but she just says, the scene in the temple court was never to fade from their minds. For some people, they never forgot that scene. That scene of, 
kids playing and laughing and people being healed and people being drawn to Jesus and the priests fleeing, but the others being drawn. She says they never forgot that. And then she, she I often write this in the paragraph here, seeds. Often I've, I've written that. Where little seeds were planted that would only be watered by the Holy Spirit after the resurrection and ascension. People said, remember that day? Remember that day when, when all of the kids, in fact, turning back here, um, <laughs> I wrote, I wrote, hmm, in the margin here. And the reason I wrote, hmm, tell me if you can relate to this or if you've ever experienced this. The sound, uh, this is the paragraph that begins, the sound, this is on page 696 of Types and Symbols, 593 of the original. Listen to this. The sound of these happy, unrestrained voices was an offense to the rulers of the temple. Um, they represented to the people that the house of God was desecrated by the feet of children and the shouts of rejoicing. You ever heard that before in church? You ever heard that? The old saint saying, hey, hey, hey. Uh, we, don't run around in church. We don't want any, these kids need to quiet down. Come on now. I love it when I'm in a church and I hear the sound of kids playing, kids crying. That's the, that's the sound of life. That's the sound of the future, right? It's a sad thing to be in a church where there's no kids playing and making noise. Yes, kids are gonna be a little over the top. They're gonna be a little expressive and excessive. Okay, yeah, they're kids. They're kids, but, but what did the religious leaders do in this situation? They said, look at all these kids running around desecrating the temple. We got a few of those saints in our churches today, man. Far better to have dozens of kids running around desecrating the sanctuary than to have no kids at all. But there are some of our beloved old crusty saints. You get the feeling they'd be happy to have no kids at all in church. Nah, I love those noises. In fact, when... I've got something in my teeth now. Whenever um, I'm in a church and a little baby starts to cry and the mother, you can see, she has that little panic and she's like gonna get up and get the child out, you know, so that she's not embarrassed and that people aren't disturbed. I always, I literally will say out loud, I've done it over and over again in churches. I say, listen, I love that sound. Don't hurry. That's the sound of life and that's the sound of the future. Right? Hallelujah. I love it. So she says, when the Pharisees came back to the temple there, she says they were utterly perplexed and disconcerted. Th they couldn't understand why they couldn't intimidate and command Jesus. And then three times she says the phrase, never before. Never before had he assumed so kingly authority. Never before had his words and works possessed so great power. Never before in a manner had he been so solemn and impressive. So Jesus here, shoving all of his chips to the middle of the table, he's trying everything everything. He's tried tenderness. He's tried parables. He's tried healings. He's tried to extend olive branches to the religious leaders. Now he's just coming in full-blown, full evidences of divinity, right? But the same thing that was, again, chasing others away, chasing the religious leaders, the pretentious religious leaders, was drawing, drawing the sinners. And, um, so then they, uh, Jesus asks them, you know, they say, look, by what authority do you do this? Who are you? And then Jesus asks them a question. In fact, I'm just going to say this because I'm not going to go deep on all these parables, the parable of the two sons and the parable of the vine dressers. I'm only going to say this. In every instance of these three encounters, Jesus ends with a question. The, the importance of this cannot be overstated. He ends with a question. So when they say, by what authority do you do this? Jesus asks the first question. Well, let me ask you a question. When John the Baptist came, um, was his baptism from God or was it just of man's invention? And now they're pinned because they had, they had supposedly received the ministry and prophetic calling of John. And now they're like, uh, we've got to be careful how we answer this. So he asked them a question. Very often, Jesus took, especially with his assailants, with the people that were trying to trap him and, and hurt him, he took the posture of interrogation. So I, I got a question for you. And then they say, well, they confer together like politicians. I just wrote politicians in the margin right here. They confer together and they say, yeah, we're not going to answer that question. You know, th these people are not driven by principle. They were not driven by the truth. They were driven by self-preservation, greed, 
they had power and they wanted to keep power. They're like a lot of modern day politicians. They don't care about the truth. They're going to say whatever they need to say, do whatever they need to do, write whatever they need to write in order to stay in positions of influence and power. So when Jesus puts the question to them, they were affronted. They were, they were so scandalized by his purity and by his simplicity and authenticity. They were just like, yeah, no. And so he asks them a question and they don't want to answer it. They don't want to answer it. And so Jesus says, well, I'm not going to answer you then. <laughs> Don't you love that? Don't you love that? Yeah, well, then I'm not going to answer your question. So um, she says when the religious leaders were getting sort of, you know, stood up by Jesus here a little bit, that they started to lose their influence and they could feel that the tide of public opinion there in the temple court was beginning to go toward Jesus and away from them. And so she says, um, by their cowardice and indecision, they had in, great, in a great measure forfeited the respect of the people who now stood amused. Oh, isn't that nice? They were amused to see these proud, self-righteous men defeated. And then that's when she says the seeds that were planted. People never forgot that day. She says those scenes never faded from the minds of those people. Imagine the guy that fell asleep on the chest of Jesus. He never forgot that. Imagine those little kids that were running around Jesus and playing, they never forgot that. Those people never forgot that day. And when they saw that, that amazing man, that inviting man, that kind man, that benevolent man hung up on a Roman instrument of torture, they were devastated. But those seeds that had been planted, and they also had a misunderstanding about the kingdom, every Jew did. But when they saw that guy is being killed and crucified, they said, no, nah. no, nah. no. Nah. And then when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they became his disciples. Jesus didn't get to see a lot of that, right? Like he was unloved and misunderstood and unappreciated to a great degree. But the seeds that were planted bore fruit in a really powerful way. And the disciples got to reap. This is what Paul means there when he says it in 1 Corinthians. The disciples got to reap all of the seeds that Jesus had planted and all of the plants that he had cultivated. They harvested, but they were just moving in on another man's harvest. They never forgot that day. Okay. Um, she makes this great point here how uh, in his contest with the rabbis, it was not Christ's purpose to humiliate his opponents. He was not glad to see them placed in a hard place. He wasn't out to show them up and show off. He was devastated. He was devastated, but then she makes this great point, very Proverbs 26, 27-esque, that she says they became entangled in a net that they had laid for Jesus. They became entangled. Proverbs 26, 27 says that the wicked dig a pit for someone else and then they fall in it. That's what happened here. Jesus was devastated. He was sad. He, was, he wanted those religious leaders to respond to him just like he wanted everybody to respond to him. He didn't want to humiliate them. He didn't want to hurt them. Right? But they had laid a trap for Jesus and then when they fell in their own trap, just like Daniel chapter, what, 6... We talked about that last chapter. Not even God can do everything. Okay, then we get into the two parables and the parable of the son that the, the father says, hey, go work today in my vineyard. And the one son says, yeah, I'll go, and then doesn't go. And then the other son says, yeah, I don't want to go, and then does go. And she makes the application that this was the religious leaders and the sinners. And the sinners were like, yeah, no, not interested in God. Don't want to, you know, follow Torah. Don't want to... But then John the Baptist preaching and Jesus preaching, and they said, you know what, on second thought, yeah, we will go. And then she says that the religious leaders are like, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, we're religious people. We'll definitely go. But then when it came right down to it, to live Torah, to serve and save and minister, they said, eh, no, nah, we'd rather watch Netflix, right? We'd rather just do our own sort of selfish thing. And um, not that selfish, not that Netflix has to be selfish. I probably shouldn't have said that. I didn't wasn't taking a jab at people that watch Netflix necessarily. You can do that excessively, of course. Um, so that's that parable. And I'm not going to say much more than that about it. Then you get the parable of the vine dressers, which I'll just go through quickly as well. And this is all based on the early chapter, I think it's chapter five of Isaiah, where God has this vineyard and Jesus tells this incredible story. And I'm purposely going to fly over the top of this because I'm extremely short on time. But the story is built against the backdrop of Daniel chapter 9. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. 
Messiah rejected, city destroyed. And so Jesus tells this whole story. There was a man and he had a vineyard and he took care of it and he put a hedge around it and a tower in it and he leased it to vine dressers and then he went away to a far country and he sent servants and they were killed and he sent other servants and they were killed and last of all, he sent his son and the son was killed. And then Jesus here again asks a question. By the way, I forgot to mention that in the second parable, he asked a question. Jesus, at the end of the second parable, or the first parable, the second question, he says, which of the two sons did the will of his father? So again, Jesus is always asking the question. You know, the first question, the baptism of John, was that of men or of God? And then, which of the two sons did the will of his father? Jesus is always inviting the people to see for themselves, to see for themselves, to, to either accuse or excuse themselves based on the answer that they give, which is very Romans 2. Right? Our thoughts either excuse or accuse us, our own thoughts. And so then now in the third question, Jesus says, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they, like King David of old, pronounce judgment on themselves. He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Jesus is like, you said it, not me. You said that, not me. And so in each case, Jesus gives a question, a question, a question. And... Um, they pronounced uh, judgment on themselves. And then Jesus gives that incredible section there where he says, have you never read that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief corner? And then Ellen White says, this was an actual thing that happened in the building of the Solomonic temple, the first temple, that there was this kind of oddly, weirdly shaped stone that were like, ah, it's a big stone. Where do we put it? So they just pushed it aside in the quarry. And then when it came time for, for a specific stone in the building of the temple, they needed a stone. They, they were trying to find, is this the stone? No, it was too weak. Is this the stone? No, it's too small. Is this the stone? And then finally, somebody made the suggestion, hey, what about that old stone that we, you know, is shaped really oddly and weirdly? Maybe that would fit in this hole, in this spot in the temple. And so they were like, eh, probably not, but I guess it can't hurt to try. So they tried it and doosh, it fit perfectly. Apparently this was an actual thing that happened in the building of the Solomonic temple. And she tells that story. And then she says, Isaiah says, and she says, and Jesus says, that oddly shaped stone that looked like it was useless, that looked like it wouldn't fit anywhere. And by the way, Jesus looks, he's an odd Messiah. He's a weird rabbi. Doesn't look like he fits anywhere. But not only does he fit somewhere, he is the cornerstone, the most important stone, the stone around which everything else finds its orientation and its safety. And she uses the word safety several times in this chapter. She uses the phrase eternal safety and perfect safety, right? Because they didn't, you know, today we have building codes to make sure that, you know, buildings are built up to standard and that they're safe. But a lot of ancient buildings fell down. That's why they have building codes, right? Because people would build these buildings and they would build them poorly and, and they weren't engineered well. And so when Jesus becomes the chief cornerstone of the living temple that God is building, she makes the point two times, it's a safe place. It's a safe place. It's a secure place. Well, friends, just receive that. If you build your life on Jesus, you're going to be okay. If, if, if you build your life around Jesus, you're going to be safe. You're going to be secure. That's the point she makes. That's the punchline of the cornerstone thing. He's the thing that looks like he doesn't quite fit, but he does fit, and he's a perfect fit. He's a perfect fit for your life and for my life, for your safety and my safety, for your salvation and my salvation, for your security and my security. And so then she goes in again and again and again. She's talking Daniel 9, and she starts saying the word foundation, 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 sure foundation, quoting Isaiah 28, 16. Foundation, 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 a sure foundation, a sure foundation. So, as you might have guessed, that's my word. She uses it like 16 times. Foundation foundation, foundation. Jennifer Jill says, great to see you, Jen, that he is our safe space. That's right. Safe space. What was your word? What was your word? My word was foundation from Isaiah 28, 16. Sure foundation, safe place, eternal safety and security. What was your word? Cornerstone. Great word. Yeah, that was all. That, that's a totally fair word. Cornerstone says Lisa 5037 Taylor. Foundation says Amber. Foundation says Scott. Amen. David says Dockets. Uh, you're going to have to walk me through that one, David. Um, 
Jen says grounded. Christian says cornerstone, great word. Five Carson so five says rock, foundation. Ooh, designed. I like that. Tulip four, God says rock, rock, appeal. Oh, teach. Good stuff. Sure foundation. And there's a lot more in this chapter, a lot more in this chapter. But she just makes that point that when Jesus is the sure foundation, when he's the cornerstone of our lives, right? Because we're not talking about a literal temple now. We're built up, as Peter says, she quotes that extensive passage there, doesn't she? And what is it, 1 Peter 3? Or is it 1 Peter 2? I should probably just read that. It's so good. Um, 1 Peter 2. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones, woo, that's us, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in scripture, behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He who believes in him will by no means be put to shame, safety, security, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word. And Jesus even mingles in a little bit of Daniel 2 imagery there when he says, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. That's Daniel 2. That's the stone that struck the image and ground it to powder. And so, so much greatness here. So much beauty in this chapter and uh, let me read you my rubric. My word was foundation. Foundation. Okay, here we go. A little past time here. I got I to gotta hurry up. Okay, point, person, prayer, practice. Here we go. What was the point of this chapter? To continue on from the previous chapter and to tell the story of the temple cleansing and of the two parables and primarily of the rejection of Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Okay, to tell that story. And then, of course, to invite us to build our lives on that cornerstone. Beautiful. Um, person. Person. What do we learn about the person of God or of Jesus in this chapter? Here's what I wrote. That God cannot compel us um, contrary to our own determined course of action. Right? This is a little bit like the last chapter. If if we are determined and set in our ways to behave in a certain way, God cannot, yea, will not compel us to behave otherwise. So rather than being pretentious and obstinate and, 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 and obdurate and stubborn, we should throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus, throw ourselves on his breast, and be safe and be secure in his arms. Be, that, be among that number, that large innumerable number that will be there, as the old gospel song says, when the saints go marching in. Come on now. Uh, what's my prayer? Uh, Lord, make me a living stone built upon the sure foundation of the righteousness of Christ. A living stone. Mm. And then finally, how do we practice this chapter? Well, I wrote to live by faith in and obedience to Jesus Christ. And I know that a lot of people don't like the word obedience. They get nervous about the word obedience. There's no reason to be nervous about the word obedience. Obedience is a great word. It's an awesome word. It's an important word. I mean, why wouldn't we want to obey the very God who made us and created us and then gave us the law that leads to life, that gave us the great truth of Scripture that leads to life? It's like if I buy a new camera, I just bought a new camera recently, I read the instructions. I, I don't have to so much anymore because I know how to operate a camera, but but this new camera that I bought is a new ca camera and, and I'm very familiar with the Canon system, but this is a new camera, one that I've not owned before. So I'm just going to read through to make sure that I'm obeying the instructions because I don't want to wreck my camera and I want to take the best possible pictures. Right, right? God's words to us are not like, have no fun, have no joy, and do whatever I say or I'll end your life prematurely. No, God's like, be blessed, live a great life, Enjoy yourselves, have pleasure, experience happiness and joy. So that is what it means to obey God. So I want to live my life, faith in Jesus and obedience to him. Not obedience in order to be his son, 
because I am his son. I am his son because of what Jesus has done. And any obedience or service that I respond to him with is only the evidence of what he has already done for me. It, it gains me no standing. It gains me no merit. It gains me no credit. Heaven forbid. All it does gets me no access. The righteousness of Christ gets me access. But I do want to live the optimal life that God has created me to live. I want to be as happy as I can be. I want to be as useful as I can be. I want to be the best blessing to the world that I can be. And God says, well, then you're going to love Torah because Torah is all about living your best life. I know that a lot of people have this really negative view and perspective on obedience. It's just crazy talk. That's the enemy talking. Obedience is awesome, right? Obedience leads to happiness and sin leads to deep depression and unhappiness and bondage. Obedience leads to freedom. And so, yeah, I want to learn how to obey Jesus, not just with my hands and my body, but in my heart of hearts. No religious pretense, no posturing, no costumes, sincerity. God, teach me how to do that. So my first word, last chapter, was pretentious. And then this word, foundation. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I've literally got to go preach. I got to take a quick shower, iron my clothes, get ready for Sabbath, and go preach. So please pray for me that tonight's sermon goes well. And um, maybe I'll even find a moment in there to eat some food. <laughs> okay, God bless you all. I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I think I'll have time tomorrow afternoon to do the next chapter. Um, cause I just preached twice in the morning and then I've got the afternoon off. So yeah, we'll have a happy Sabbath blessing sometime tomorrow, probably afternoon, late afternoon, evening, and, um, it'd be great. I haven't even looked at the next chapter yet, so it'll be fun. God bless you all. Let's have a quick prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for these two amazing chapters that are simultaneously a strong warning, but also an incredible encouragement a deep encouragement to us. And Father, help us to live um, being mindful of the times in which we live. Father, one of the great critiques that Jesus had of the people of his day was that they didn't understand the times in which they were living. Father, we're living in portentous times, unusual times, times that are pregnant with prophetic significance and meaning. Father, help us to know the times that we're living in. And Father, help us to live our lives of of service and kindness and blessing for others and not just selfish lives of greed and the accumulation of wealth and a bunch of stuff that's going to burn anyway. Father, teach us what it means to live in our heart of hearts in true obedience to you and fill us with your spirit that we might be the men and women that you have called us and created us to be. Give us a great Sabbath. Be with me as I go to preach tonight and uh, we just place our lives into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you all. I love you, and I will see you sometime tomorrow. Bye-bye.